Uh, I'd like to just say a few words uh, preliminarily, and then uh, uh, the highlight for me will be getting your questions in, 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 in a few minutes, because uh, uh, I want to talk about what's on your mind. I urge you to throw hardballs. It's, it's, it's more fun for me if you, uh, if you put, a little, uh, put a little speed on the pitches as they come in. That you can ask about anything except the last week's Texas A&M game. And that's off limits. <laughs> Uh, we have a couple of men here from SunTrust. I was just up at the Coke meeting, uh, and I sat next to Jimmy Williams there, who ran SunTrust for many years, and uh, uh, he wanted to be sure that I wore this SunTrust shirt down here. I've tried to get sponsorship on the Senior Golf Tour. I haven't had much luck, but now on the Bankers Tour, I'm doing a little bit better. And uh, he said I got a percentage of the increase in deposits from Gainesville. So, so I'll go out for SunTrust, dear old SunTrust. Uh, I would like to talk for just one minute up to the students about your about your future when you leave here because there's you're going to learn a tremendous amount about investments uh, and you'll learn you'll learn enough to do well you you've all got the IQ to do well you've all got the initiative and energy to do well or you wouldn't be you wouldn't be here uh, and most of you will succeed in 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 in, in meeting your aspirations uh, but in in determining whether you succeed uh, there's more to it than intellect and energy, and I'd like to talk for just a second about that. In fact, uh, there was a fellow that Pete Kiewit in Omaha used to say that he looked for three things in hiring people. He looked for integrity, intelligence, and energy, and he said if, the, if that person didn't have the first two, that the latter two would kill them, because if they don't have integrity, you want them dumb and lazy. <laughs> you don't want them smart and energetic. Uh, and I'd, I'd really like to talk about that first one because we, we know you've got the second two. And, and I, to play along with me in a little game for just a second uh, in, in, in terms of thinking about that question, uh, you've all been here, I, I guess almost all of your second year MBAs, and you've gotten to know your classmates. And think for a moment that I granted you the right to buy 10% of one of your classmates for the rest of his or her lifetime. Um, now you can't pick one with a rich father. That doesn't count. I mean, you've got to uh, you've got to pick them, uh, pick somebody who's going to do it on their own merit. And and I gave you an hour to think about it. Which one are you going to pick among all your classmates as the one you want to own 10 percent of for the rest of their lifetime? And are you going to give them an IQ test? Pick the one with the highest IQ. I doubt it. Are you going to pick the one with the best grades? Uh, I doubt it. Uh, you're not even going to pick the most energetic one necessarily, or the one that displays the most initiative. But you're going to start looking for qualitative factors in addition, because everybody's got enough brain there and, and, and enough energy. And I would say that if you thought about it for an hour and decided who you're going to place that bet on, you'd probably pick the one who you responded the best to, because uh, the one that was going to have the leadership qualities, the ones that were going to be able to get other people to carry out uh, their interests. And that would be the person who was generous and honest and who gave credit to other people even if for their own ideas, all kinds of qualities like that. And you could write down those qualities that you admire in this other person, whoever you admire most in the class. And then I would throw in a hooker. I would say as part of owning 10% of this person, you had to agree to go short 10% of somebody else in the class. Uh, that's more fun, isn't it? <laughs> and you think, well, now who do I want to go short of? And uh, uh, again, you wouldn't pick the person with the lowest IQ or the, or, uh, you, you, would, you would start thinking about the person really who turned you off for one reason or another. I mean, they had very, various qualities, quite apart from their academic achievement, but they had various qualities. In the end, you shouldn't really want to be around them, and other people didn't want to be around them. And what were the qualities that lead to that? Well, there'd be a whole bunch of things. You know, but it's the person who's egotistical, the person who's greedy, the person who slightly dishonest, cuts corners, all of these qualities. And you can write those down on the right-hand side of the page. And when you look at that, we'll just, I don't know which one I'm using. Can you hear me okay with us? You have to have fine. Uh, yeah. The microphone on the side. What do I do with it? It just came loose. Oh, it just came loose. Okay. You can see why I avoid technology. <laughs> Chewing gum is about as far as I get. Uh, as you looked at those qualities on the left and right hand side, there's one interesting thing about them. It's not the ability to throw a football 60 yards. Uh, it's, not, it's not the ability to run the 100 yard dash in 9-3. It's not being the best looking person in the class. They're all qualities that if you really want to have the ones on the left hand side, you can have them. I mean, they are, they're qualities of behavior, temperament, character that 
that are achievable. They're not forbidden to anybody in this group. And if you look at the qualities on the right-hand side, the ones that you find turn you off in other people, there's not a, there's not a quality there that you have to have. If you have it, you can, you, can, you, can, you can get rid of it. And you can get rid of it a lot easier at your age than you can at my age because uh, most behavior is, is, is habitual. And they say the chains of habit are too light to be felt until they're too heavy to be broken. And there's no question about it. I see people with these self-destructive behavior patterns at my age or even 10 or 20 years younger, and they really are entrapped by them. They, they go around and they do things that turn off other people uh, right and left. And uh, uh, they don't need to be that way, but by a certain point they get so they can hardly change it. But at your age, you can have any, any, any habits, any, any patterns of behavior that you wish. It's simply a question of which you decide and why not decide the ones that, I mean, if you like, uh, Ben Graham did this, and Ben Franklin did it before him, but Ben, ben Graham in his, low, in his low teens looked around and he looked at the people he admired and he said, you know, I want to be admired, so why don't I just behave like them? And he found there was nothing impossible about behaving like them. And similarly, he, he did the same thing on, on the reverse side in terms of getting rid of those qualities. So I would suggest that if you write those qualities down and think about them a little while and make them habitual, you will be the one that you want to buy 10% of when you get all through. And the beauty of it is you already own 100% and you're stuck with it. So you might as, you might as well be that person as uh, somebody else. Well, that's, that's a short little sermon. So let's get on to what, uh, what you're interested in. And uh, like I say, you can, you can go all over the lot. So I don't know exactly how we're going to handle this. But, uh, but uh, let's start with a hand here someplace or other. Where do we go with the first one? Yeah, right here. Your thoughts about Japan. My thoughts about Japan, I'm, I'm, I'm not a macro guy. Now I say to myself, Berkshire Hathaway can borrow money for 10 years at 1% in Japan now. 1%. And I say to myself, gee, I took Graham's class 45 years ago and I've been working hard at this thing all my life. Maybe I can earn more than 1%. You know, if I really worked hard at it. 1% annually. It doesn't seem impossible, does it? So. I wouldn't want to get involved in currency risk, so I'd have to do it in something that was yen denominated. So I have to get, I have to be in Japanese real estate or a Japanese business or something of the sort, and be, and all I have to do is beat one percent, and that's all the money's going to cost me, and I can get it for ten years. Uh, so far, I haven't found anything. Uh, that, uh, <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it's kind of interesting. The, the Japanese companies earn very low returns on equity, and and. Uh, uh, they have a bunch of businesses that earn four, five, six percent on equity, and it's very hard to earn a lot as an investor when the business you're in doesn't earn very much money. Now, now some people do it. In fact, I've got a friend, Walter Schloss, who worked with Graham at the same time I did, and and it was the first way I went at stocks to buy stocks selling way below working capital, very cheap quantitative stocks. I call it the cigar butt approach to investing. Is that you walk down the street and you look around for a cigar butt someplace and you finally you see one and it's soggy and kind of repulsive but there's one puff left in it so you pick it up and the puff is free I mean it's a cigar butt stock I mean you get one free puff out of it and then you throw it away and you walk down the street trying to find another one of it. Uh, I mean it's not elegant uh, uh, but it works you know if, if you're looking for a free puff uh, it works those are low return businesses but time is the friend of the wonderful business, it's the enemy of, of the lousy business. If you're in a lousy business for a long time, you're going to get a lousy result, even if you buy it cheap. If you're in a wonderful business for a long time, even if you pay a little too much going in, you're going to get a wonderful result if you stay in a long time. I find very few wonderful businesses in Japan at, at, at present now. At the, they may change the culture in some way so that, that, that management's get more stockholder responsive over there and returns are higher. But at the present time, you'll find a very lot of low return businesses and that was true even when the Japanese economy was booming I mean it's, it's amazing they had a incredible market without incredible companies uh, uh, they were incredible in terms of doing a lot of business but they weren't incredible in terms of the return on equity that, and uh, that they achieved uh, uh, and that finally caught up with them so we have so far done nothing there but as long as money's one percent I'll keep looking I mean uh, yeah, yeah you were rumored to be one of the rescue buyers of long-term capital what, what was the play there? What did you see? Well, there's a story in the current Fortune magazine one has Rupert Murdoch's picture on the cover that tells the whole story of our involvement. It, it's kind of an interesting story because I, I, well, I, it's, a, it's a long story, so I won't go into all the background of it, but I got the really serious call about long-term capital 
uh, what, four weeks ago this Friday, whenever it was, it was my granddaughter, I got it in mid-afternoon and my granddaughter was having her birthday party that evening and then I was flying that night to Seattle to go on a 12-day trip with Gates on a, to Alaska in a private train, all kinds of things where I was really out of communication. But I got this call on a Friday afternoon saying that things were really getting serious there. I'd had some other calls before that the article gets into a few weeks earlier. I know those people, most of them pretty well. So a lot of them were Solomon when I was there. And uh, the place was imploding. And the Fed was sending people up that weekend. And so between that Friday and the following Wednesday when the New York Fed um, in effect orchestrated a, a, a rescue effort but without any federal money involved, uh, I was quite active, but I was having this terrible time because we were sailing up through these uh, through these canyons, which held no interest for me whatsoever in Alaska. And and the captain would say, you know, if we just steer over here, we might see some bears and whales. And I said, steer where you got a good satellite connection. Cause I want <laughs> so. So it was, uh, in fact, there's a picture, unfortunately, where I've got my uh, old faithfuls going off behind me, and I've got my back to it. I'm on the phone, which was the people in the group thought it was kind of funny the way I was <laughs> working the phone. But we put in a bit on, on, on Wednesday morning. I was, by then, I was in uh, Bozeman, Montana, and I talked to uh, Bill McDonough, the head of the New York Fed, about, uh, about 10 o'clock. They were having a meeting of the bankers at 10 o'clock that morning in, in, in New York, and I caught him. Right. We actually delivered a message to him. He called me out there in Wyoming a little bit before 10 New York time, and we made a bid. It was a. It was uh, because it was being done at a long distance and everything. It was really the outline of a bid. But uh, in the end, uh, it was a bid for 250 million, essentially for the net assets of. Uh, but we would have put in three and three quarters billion on top of that, and it would have been three billion from Berkshire Hathaway, 700 million from AIG, and 300 million from Goldman Sachs, and. We submitted that, but we put a very short time fuse on it because when you're bidding on $100 billion worth of securities that are moving around, you don't want to leave a fixed price bid out there very long, plus we were worried about it getting shopped. Uh, in the end, they, they, the bankers made the deal, and uh, uh, but it was, an, it was an interesting period. The whole long-term capital management, and I hope most of you are familiar with it, but the, but the whole story is really fascinating because if you take John Merriweather and Eric Rosenfeld Larry Hillenbrand, Greg Hawkins, Victor Agani, the two Nobel Prize winners, Merton Scholes. If you take the 16 of them, they probably have as high an average IQ as any 16 people working together in one business in the country, including at Microsoft or, or wherever you want to name. So an incredible amount of intellect in that room. Now you combine that with the fact that those 16 had had extensive experience in the field they were operating. I mean, this, this, this was not a bunch of guys who had made their money, you know, selling men's clothing and then all of a sudden went into the securities business or anything. They'd had, they'd, they'd had in aggregate, the 16 had probably had 350 or 400 years of experience doing exactly what they were doing.